What will my answer be? What can I say? When Jesus beckons me home What will my answer be? What can I say? When Jesus beckons me home What can I bring that will ever repay The wonderful love He has shown Day follows night, night follows day Farther and farther I run What will my answer be? What can I say? When Jesus beckons me Sometimes the clouds seem to cover his face. Sometimes the skies are gray. But by his love and his wonderful grace, does he roll the dark clouds away? Day follows night, night follows day. Farther and farther I run. What will my answer be? What can I say? When Jesus beckons me home Day follows night, night follows day Farther and farther we roam What will your answer be? What will you say? When Jesus beckons you home Prison Spirit Day. And thank you very much, Katrina, for making a slight grandioso at the end there <laughs> so that we could, and the same with Come Lord Jesus, slow down so that we could think about it and make it a prayer. William, thank you for William for, for reading to us that wonderful portion from Luke. Do many of you remember that story about Zacchaeus? Now, Zacchaeus was a very little man, and a very little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Savior he wanted to see. For the Savior he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up into the tree. And say, now Zacchaeus, you come down. down. As I used to learn that, we used to say, and said, and I remember Amy Pascoe, Philip's mother, and Miriam, Jennifer's mother, at that point saying, now Zacchaeus, you come down, because we're coming to your house for tea. We're coming to your house for tea. <laughs> I learned that as a child. Sadly, it didn't stay with me uh, it, it, when I became a teenager and I walked away from the church. But a little later on, through a, through a convict, an ex-convict, Fred Lemon, I was brought back into the church. But uh, that meant something. And uh, thank you for reading that. Two things I want to say just before I read Revelations uh, about, <laughs> about Zacchaeus. First of all, he had Duck's disease. Anybody know what Duck's disease is? I'm surprised you in surprise. My wife told me this. She suffers from Duck's disease. If you ever look at a duck out of water, there's a part of his anatomy which is closer to the ground. And uh, short people, apparently, that got short legs, they're known as Duck's disease because they're short. Zacchaeus had Duck's disease. He was short. He couldn't see. And at the very end of that, you may have, you may not have questioned, but Jesus says, salvation has come to this house, for he was born of Abraham. And I just want to clarify, if you don't know what that means, Jesus was saying, of all people, 
rich and wealthy and a tax collector, a chief of tax collector, he was a Jew. He was, he was a son of Abraham. He was a Jew. And he had bought the right from the Romans to not only uh, tax his own people, but to subcontract others to actually tax. So that's what that meant. Thinking about Zacchaeus and the fact Jesus said, make haste and come down, I'm coming to your house this day. I want to read, before we have him, I want to read this from Revelation. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's right at the very end. Uh, it's at chapter 3 of Revelation. And to the angel of the church of the later sins, write, These things says the old man, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, just pause for a moment. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, wait. And open the door. We will meditate upon that pause in a moment. First of all, we will you mention us about Zacchaeus? And uh, Zacchaeus was a very little man, short in stature, and so he couldn't see. But he was curious about seeing this person called Jesus, who multitudes follow. And his curiosity led him to want to see. And so he ran ahead, proactively ran ahead, and he went up into a, 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 a sycamore fig tree, and there he had a vantage point. Often when I read this, and I read it quite often, and I think to myself, what a hiccup it must have been. He was up in a tree, looking down, uh, curious, and suddenly Jesus, with a multitude behind him, making his way, suddenly stopped, looked into a tree, and looked at Zacchaeus as if Jesus knew he was there. Do you think Jesus didn't know he was there? He knew he was there. He knew he was there the same as he knew Saul was on the road to Damascus with letters of authority. He knew Jonah was running away from the work he had to do. Incidentally, and I won't go too far this way, that's another sermon. Saul, when he was converted, was blinded for three days. Jonah was in the whale for three days. Do you know that? And when I read that, I thought, ah, God is telling us something here. When God wants us to do something and we procrastinate, do anything rather than do what he wants us to do, you know, he calls Saul and Jonah to be in darkness. And sometimes, you know, he creates darkness around us until we realize what he wants us to do. Zacchaeus was in the tree and I uh, just imagine that, oh, I didn't expect for him, I didn't, oh, well, I'm not here for this. And this is what Jesus said, make haste and come down, Zacchaeus, because I need to come to your place. Wow, can you imagine the thrill? 
I didn't even know he knew I was ill. I'm only curious, and yet he has stopped. Of all these people, he stopped and he's called me. The Bible says he made haste. He made haste and came down from the tree. Any chance of me? I think I would have fell out of the tree. But he came, he made haste, he came down, and we don't know, but he obviously invited Jesus into his house, and uh, it was the presence of Jesus. Luke didn't record actually what. Um, what, uh, what was said in the house, but all we hear is the, this great presence of Jesus in the, the abiding presence in the house of Zacchaeus, it changed his life. He was a rich chief of tax collector. He was a Jew, Jesus said, son of Abraham. He had bought the right in order to tax his own people. There was an element of self-preservation. He wasn't going to go short on it. And there was obviously occasions when he took a little bit more than he should have. And yet just being in the presence of Jesus, the truth came out. If I've done anything, I will give it back. And if I've taken anything illegally, I will give to you now. When you look at what Zacchaeus was doing, Zacchaeus, who was recorded by Luke as being a chief and a rich man, a wealthy man, he was prepared to make himself poor. He was prepared to make himself poor. And Jesus himself said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man is nowhere. And the rich young widow that came to him and said, what must I do to have eternal life? It wasn't mandatory that everybody have to sell everything they have, but Jesus was talking to the rich young widow, and what he said to the rich young widow was, if you want confidence and confirmation that you are going to heaven here on earth then you have to sell all you've got and give to the poor and become dependent as I am. We sometimes misread that. Zacchaeus, wow, what a change in a man, a wealthy man. What makes me laugh, and I laughed when, when I heard William read him. <laughs> the attitude, <laughs> the attitude of those who were following Jesus, the attitude of those who were not only the multitude following Jesus, but those who, who heard his ministry, who believed in him, who wanted to show that they were, and the first thing they turned around and said, well, of all the darn people, of all I've done, he hadn't chose to come to my house, but he he darn he gone and, 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 and come to the house of a sinner. We hadn't changed much over two thousand years of us. People come in, new people come into our church, into our fellowship, and it didn't long before we tried to tell them what they should be doing, how we do things. The presence of Jesus. Make haste and come down. Because I want to come, I want to come to your house. Jesus didn't just walk into the house, Luke doesn't record it. But there must have been a point at which Zacchaeus said, Wow, in haste came down. He must have said, Wow, I can't believe this. Lord, come in. Didn't get the over out. Or Mr. Sheen. Didn't make arrangements. He just said, come in. This is where I want, this is where the pause happens in Revelations. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will dine with him. In another translation, I will sup with him. In another translation, I will abide with him. But there's a comma. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, comma, I will come in. There's two things missing. And I don't think they're a mistake. I think Jesus leaves it to us. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. He will come in if he is invited. When I thought about this, I thought of the many people in and out the church over the years, countless years. I wonder how many people have heard the voice of Jesus. I wonder how many people 
have heard him knocking on their hearts and they've opened the door and he's been there for a lifetime. He's heard all their anxieties, all their fears, all their problems, all the reasons why they can't totally commit. But they never invited him over the threshold. There's many people worshiping the day that go to worship, but they've never actually invited Jesus into their life. They've not invited him and they've not welcomed him. Zacchaeus invited Jesus into his house and welcomed the changes that he was to make. Salvation has come this day to this house. And the more I read this, it's, a, it's an old text. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I've been with, in the past with many evangelists, Don Summers, Dick Saunders, Joe Fudge, that have used this text as an evangelistic outreach. But you know, it's not just for those who have never known, it's for us to consider. I wonder how many have heard the voice of Jesus speaking over the years, knocking on their heart's door, and yet have never invited him. They've opened the door, but they've not invited him over the threshold. Let me show you a picture, I'm sure many of you I've seen this before in various ways. Do you know the title of that? <coughs> the Light of the World. The Light of the World. Painted by William Holman Hunt. He was a pre raphaelite artist. And uh, in around 1827 to 1910, and uh, they're representing this figure of Jesus preparing to knock on an overgrown and long unopened door. That's what the, 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 this uh, picture is about. It's Jesus that's standing with a, lamp, a, lamp, a lantern in his hand as the light of the world, knocking on the door which hasn't been opened, which is embroiled in, in, uh, in bramble. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will also sup with him and he with me. Now, according to William Hunt, Holman Hunt, he said, I painted the picture with what I thought, unworthy though I was, to be divine command and not simply a good subject. The door in the painting has no handle, and that was another artist that came to him on one occasion and said, What a nice painting, but you made a mistake. And William Holman Hunt said, oh, I've made a mistake. He said, you've made a mistake. Your painting isn't finished. Isn't finished. Why is that, said Holman Hunt? Because <coughs> he said, you've not, you've, you've not painted a handle on the outside. And uh, Holman Hunt was able to use a testimony. The door is the painting has no handle and can therefore be opened only from the inside. That was the point of the painting. There is no door handle on the outside. It can only be opened by the person inside. Representing, and this is what I like from Mormon Hunt, representing the obstinately shut mind. Those who don't want to commit. The painting was considered by many to be the most important and culturally influential <coughs> rendering of Christ of its time. Light of the world. Wasn't a, a mistake. There's no door handle on the outside. Jesus is knocking the door of, of everyone's heart. Can I just can I just make you sure? When you say heart, when you talk to a young person, they say, well, heart is thing that pumps blood. Mine don't pump all that good occasionally. And uh, but a heart. But what when when the when the when the biblical version of heart it's the very soul of man. It's the heart of man. It's what defines us, who we are, and what we are, and what we become. And this is what Holman Hunt was trying to say. Jesus is the light of the world standing outside the door of our soul, and he's knocking. And he's asking if he may come in. And I'll ask the question. It took me a long while. 
to hear his voice and hear the knock took me a long while, like several years, before I actually opened the door and said, Father, Lord, come in. Here's a thought from Max Lucado. Jesus, the one who stands at the door. Let me state something important, says Max. There is never a time during which Jesus is not speaking. Never. There is never a place in which Jesus is not present. Never. There is never a room so dark, a lounge so sensual, an office so sophisticated that the ever-present, ever-pursuing, relentlessly tender friend is not there, tapping gently on the doors of our hearts, waiting to be invited in. Never. The never interprets, says Max, our numbness <coughs> as his absence. Our obstinately shut minds never take that as that Jesus is in present. For amidst the fleeting promises of pleasure is the timeless promise of his presence. Never a time when he's not speaking. Never a time when he's not present. Never a time when he is not tapping, waiting to be invited in. But he is always ready to enter. There is no chorus, Max ends with, there is no chorus so loud that the voice of God cannot be heard. If we but listen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. William mentioned Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8 to 11 and 13, he says this, <clears throat> Thus said the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. In verse 10, he goes on to say, They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them, even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways a shall be elevated. And he concludes in verse 13, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, quoted the first part of that from Isaiah. Paul said, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, quoting from Isaiah chapter 49 verse 8. But Paul didn't stop there. Paul concluded by saying, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, rich, make haste to come down. I want to come to your place. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will dine, I will sup, I will abide. Do you know what Paul said when he declared his Heritage, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Pharisee, I've studied the law. And we know that, or we believe he studied at the, the feet of Gamaliel. And he went on to say, and when we talk about zeal, he said, zeal, enthusiasm, I went out with letters of authority to persecute the Christians. Every good thing that he claimed as a devout Jew, he said, was rubbish. Rubbish. 
sit for the Domino. Rather than knowing Jesus Christ as my Saviour. And abiding in him and him abiding in me. That was Paul's declaration of all that I was. This is what I require. This is what I want. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, if I'm invited, I will come in. If I am welcomed, I will make changes in your life you would never believe. Zacchaeus made himself poor and offered to give the rest of his life. I'm challenging you as I'm challenging me. Have we opened the door? How long have we kept Jesus on the threshold? Or have we invited him in? Have we welcomed the changes he can make? The changes he can still make. He hasn't finished yet. Be all I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door and invites me in, I'm prepared to make the changes. Are you prepared to welcome?